Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for joining us for another episode of the Jane Irrigation Training uh, Series. I'm Richard Rastusha, Vice President of Water Management Solutions. And uh, today we're going to be talking about something that is on everybody's mind uh, in the West, that's for sure, but uh, really I think across the nation, and that is the, uh, the, the drought that we're experiencing now. Things are heating up, and uh, we haven't had much rainfall in a while. And uh, we're not just going to talk about the drought because uh, I know a lot of people do that. Uh, more importantly, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how to combat the drought. Some tips that you can take as a water manager, as a grower, to uh, use technology to uh, make sure you are managing your water to your best use, uh, which will attribute to uh, uh, better yields and lower cost of water, and most importantly, you know, some water savings uh, so that uh, everybody can benefit from that. So taking us through the subject today is uh, uh, Vice President of Jane Distribution Holdings, uh, Jeff Tool. And um, for those of you who know Jeff, you know, he does a great job on these trainings. Uh, I've worked with Jeff for over 20 years now and uh, served on the IA with him. We were both on the board at the same time. And one of the things I really appreciate about Jeff is he really does understand this technology well, but more importantly, he's really committed to making sure that you understand the technology. And you know, when you work with people or you see other people talking about technology, you see sometimes some frustration with uh, somebody not getting it. Well, Jeff's as patient as, uh, as anyone I know and making sure that uh, we all understand what he's talking about and that, uh, that we're comfortable using technology. And you know, that's really a gift. And I wanna say thank you for that, Jeff. And uh, thanks for joining us today. I oh, appreciate that, uh, Richard. And, and it truly is a, a passion for me. And you know, honestly, when you and I talked about this subject, I probably felt more, more anxious about this subject than I have some of the others because of the importance. And um, so, uh, I feel honored to talk about, you know, the drought today and how ag tech can, can help and, and try to give some tips that would be meaningful and um, you know, help help some of the uh, the listeners today, you know, benefit from uh, from technology in time of drought. Yeah, well, we sure do appreciate it. And the first question I have for you, Jeff, is, uh, boy, I'm looking at a map here. I believe that's the drought monitor map. Uh, right. How bad is the drought this year? This looks terrible. Yeah, it's 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 pretty bad. This is this is the most recent um, map, uh, and uh, from from the state of California, <clears throat> and a hundred percent of California is in a moderate uh, drought, and and ninety four, almost ninety five percent is in a severe drought, and then seventy five percent, which is frankly amazing is in what would be classed as, as extreme extreme drought and then you know the dark areas that you see on on the map there the darkest areas are what they call an exceptional drought and 26 percent of California is uh, is having an exceptional drought so you know we're expecting the the fire hazards are are extreme at this point you have you know, wildlife that will be affected. You have wetlands that are expected to dry up or water is already receding. A lot of our reservoirs, you know, I'm a big fisherman, bass fisherman. A lot of the reservoirs, the water is is down. Um, it's unbelievable where you have to go to put your boat in compared to where, you know, you might put your boat in in years past. So it's very real um, and, and it's, it's a big, big issue. Yeah, so I'm very, very sorry to hear that. Um, one thing I think is interesting about this discussion today, right? We've talked a lot about software together. Uh, today, we're talking about hardware. And yeah, I don't think everybody completely gets how important good hardware is until I say things like, well, go put your cell phone or your iPhone out on a stick in the middle of a field and leave it there for a year and come back and see if it still works. Right, I mean, your uh, yeah. your yeah. your hardware—it's unbelievable the uh, the quality and uh, uh, the efficiency that uh, that you get from this hardware. I, I think that's just great. Um, but before you talk about hardware, uh, one other thing I wanted to talk about is just irrigation uh, system performance and how that affects everything here as well. 
You know, it's it's a great it's a great question, and really distribution uniformity. Before we even talk about you know hardware and some of the things we can do um, in the in the field as far as you know monitoring and measuring, thinking about the distribution uniformity. You know, Corey and I were talking about this this earlier, and it could be one of the most critical things. He was he was reading some excerpts from uh, the Sashio report that just came out and having functional high performing irrigation systems was top of mind and top of the list. And so I would be remiss if I didn't call it out here. And, uh, you know, Corey and I played around with some examples. And so just to help the listeners think about how important this is, if you were gonna put 40 inches of water out on a crop this year and you had um, a 90% distribution uniformity. You would divide the 40 inches by 0.9, you'd get 44.4 inches. That's how much you'd have to actually put out to make sure every crop, you know, every plant in the field um, got the, the um, minimum amount of water, the 40 inches. If for example, your DU wasn't what you expected and it was at 75%, you divide that same 40 inches that you wanna put out by 0.75 and you have to put out 53.3 inches. Hmm. And that's that's 20% more water um, on a 15% swing or 15% difference between a, a 0.9 DU and a 0.75 DU. And so, Sometimes we, you know, we've talked about this in our water management services where before you think about technology, it's really, really a good idea to check the distribution uniformity of your system. And in a time of drought, putting out an extra 20% of water is huge. Um, there's hardly anything I can tell you about today from a technology standpoint that's, that could save you that much water. I mean, we can get close um, depending on, you know, how much people are over irrigating. But that extra 20%, and you have to think about it on the opposite side, if you say, well, I'm, I'm not going to put that out, well, then you're going to be deficit irrigating, you know, a large percentage of, of your crop if you don't put out that, say, 53 inches in this example. So, you know, thanks for raising that. It's a, it's a critical topic, especially in a time of drought. Um, I really encourage, you know, growers to, to look at their distribution uniformity. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out, Jeff. And the other thing that's interesting about that to me is, you know, for our landscape customers, you know, a 75% DU would be great. Right? Yeah. A lot of them are operating at less than that. So you can imagine how much uh, overwatering is uh, happening there as a result right. of the, uh, the system. So, uh, yeah, thanks Absolutely. for pointing that yep. out. All right. Well, shall we, uh, shall we move on? Yeah, it'd be great. Let's just jump right in. So here, here's a list of some of the hardware and some of the uh, ag tech uh, tips we'll talk about today. I'm gonna start with soil moisture. I, I believe that you know, soil moisture is, is one of the most important elements. Um, we're gonna look at, at flow and pressure. So monitoring flow and pressure in the field and at the pump stations. I'm gonna talk really briefly about automation and how automation at your pump and valves can help save water. Uh, and then lastly, we'll talk about uh, weather stations and, and really what how they can help. In this case, you really, I make this statement and I, and I mean it very sincerely, you can't manage what you don't measure. And, and that's in business, that's in a lot of things we do. But when you think about irrigation systems and you think about water management, if, you, if you're not measuring it and you're not tracking it, you really can't manage it. So I just wanna start off with uh, making that, that statement. So most of you have seen uh, this, this particular image up here and I'm not gonna go into a lot of details, but I wanna orient everyone uh, in terms of what's important so that as we go into the examples, everyone will kind of get that. So, you know, what I, what I want to do is, this is the chart we've shown before and everybody has seen this, your saturation point, you know, field capacity, water holding capacity between your wilt point 
in your field capacity, et cetera. And then you've got your allowable depletion. This is a simplified version, you know, of that. And I've got another one in just a second that'll even, you know, hopefully make it more simple. So in that desired range, when you look at and think about your available water, you wanna fill up to your field capacity and field capacity being the amount of water the soil will hold that's available to the plant. If you go beyond field capacity um, too far, you'll end up you know, moving towards saturation and the water will fall through and we'll see some examples of that. And then as you're allowing the crop to consume the water and, and, and the uh, evaporation occurs, so you can think of evapotranspiration, you're going to travel down this. So, so as in this case, you can see this as the water is being consumed and, and moving in the soil and you're gonna hit a refill point. This is your allowable depletion level. And that's where you wanna start irrigation. And again, we'll see some examples here. Obviously the two areas to stay away from is a permanent wilting point. And then, you know, getting up above this field capacity area into saturation. That's probably what we see most, uh, most commonly. So the next slide on this is really just to show you, I, th this is all of what we just talked about here. So saturation, field capacity, your plants happy between your allowable depletion and your field capacity um, is what we provide in Gene Logic. And these are the icons that show on every field where you have a soil moisture probe in, in Gene Logic. And we take care of a lot of the guesswork for you. So assuming that you set your boundaries, um, your upper boundary and your lower boundary, your allowable depletion and your field capacity correctly, then we're gonna give you an indication of when the soil is too wet. And that's when it's greater than, um, it's, 100, it's over 100%. <clears throat> and it's wet when it's between 75 and 100. You're in the very good, which is a dark green at 50 to 75%. And that's the difference between you know, your field capacity and your allowed depletion. You're good at 25 to 50%. You're starting to get low at zero to 25%. And then you're dry if you get down uh, below a zero percent. And that would be getting down below this maximum allowable depletion. So all these percentages are kind of riding right in this boundary right here. And you can at a glance with Jane Logic look and see these colors in your fields and kind of know where you're at. So Jeff, uh, these yeah. indicators, uh, it's like a window to what's happening underneath the soil line, right? Something we've never really had before. I mean, we've had for a while, but uh, a yeah. lot of people aren't using, right? That's what I mean. Right. Right. So a um, lot, lot of growers aren't having that, uh, that um, access to what's happening below the soil line. Uh, and you get this information from your soil moisture sensors, is that right? Correct, correct. And if, if any of our Jane Logic users out there have any questions you know, on this or have some concerns about whether or not their boundaries are set correctly, we'll talk a little bit about it today um, in the webinar, but I would encourage you to contact our customer support group um, Richard Gates or your account manager. And these guys are well-versed and, and know, you know can, can help lead you through the process of making sure these boundaries are set correctly so that these icons then you know, be, will become very meaningful for you. So yeah, and if you've, uh, if you've ever called in and talked to customer service or uh, Richard Gates, boy, uh, uh, it's, you really do get a wealth of knowledge there. People have been doing it for a lot of years and Absolutely. Uh, more than happy to help. Absolutely. Great, great team, great team. So here are some uh, soil moisture monitor monitoring drought tips. And, um, you know, I, I put these, you know, in, in somewhat of order. Um, so you want to look at really delaying, and we'll see an example of this, when you can delay your spring irrigation as long as, long as possible. So we're talking about this first bullet point here you'll see how much water you can save. It, it's one of the things we see growers, everybody wants to get water going. You know, we start getting a little warmer in the spring. Um, <clears throat> this year was a good example where we didn't have as much rain as we might normally have. So um, we saw growers, you know, starting irrigation a little earlier than normal. 
And sometimes that's necessary and sometimes it's not. If you're using, you know, your soil moisture probes and you're looking at um, <clears throat> the root zone, you can tell what water's in there and when you need to uh, start irrigation. And we'll, we'll go through an example on that. The next one is maintain moisture in the root zone. You know, obviously moisture outside of the root zone isn't helping your crop, whether that's a row crop or trees, orchard, citrus, whatever it is that you might be growing. If you're putting water um, at, at a rate or a, a quantity that is going outside of the root zone, then you're wasting that. I would say the one exception to that is, and this is normally happens, you know, in the in our winter times when we get the rains, and that is to push salts down. So, you know, there are fields where salts are an issue. And, um, you know, there are times of the year when those salts need to be pushed down. And in that case, you, you want to flush, flush that soil and, and go to saturation and push, push those salts down. I call this drive between the lines. So this is driving, you know, between the, the field capacity down to your maximal allowable completion. That was those last um, charts that we looked at. So it's really staying between those lines. It's, it's, it's really critical. It will help you optimize the water that you're applying and, uh, and it'll help minimize any losses or excess or over irrigation. This next one, shorter uh, duration and more frequent irrigation. Again, some of this depends on your soil type. We'll have a good example on some sandier soil that I'll show where we have a grower that's that's doing this and is, is being very successful with it, using less water than he's, he's used in the past. And a lot of that has to do with employing um, the soil moisture probe and having those boundaries set appropriately and then managing it within those boundaries. And he's gotten his boundaries down pretty tight, which means he's really, he's really managing his water well. And then the last bullet here is really not a tip but it's really something to put this on the front of our growers' minds. Over irrigation is really the number one cause of, of excessive water use. And that over irrigation can come and be caused by you know, many different factors. So I just wanna remind everyone, really managing your, your irrigation level, the timing and the amount of irrigation is what this is all about, regardless you know, of the technology that you're employing. So with this, we'll move into some of the, uh, the scenarios here. So in this case, what you have is a fourth leaf pistachios. And you can see there was some early irrigation here around, um, this was early, early January, early to mid January. This particular grower, they had some soil issues, they had some salt issues. So they applied calcium through their, through their drip system and really gave a pretty good shot you know, early in the year. That was on top of the rain, a little bit of rain that, that we had. And, you know, as you can see, they had a delay before their first irrigation of four months. Wow. And you, you don't see a lot of growers that will, will hold out. It's a little bit of a, of a gosh, I don't know, it's almost like a stare down or a, you know, a poker match where who's going to flinch first, you know, who's going to, who's going to irrigate first. And, and I, I can tell you, I've talked to a lot of growers and when you ask you you notice you, you started up water you know pretty early yeah well my neighbor started i figured it was time you know and and so guys get nervous um and they see others start irrigating and um so they figure well it's it's time for me to irrigate it, it's, it's frankly way better to use um, technology <clears throat> and in this case looking at this soil moisture you can see between these boundaries this blue line um, is the field capacity. So that, that's what you want to fill up to. This is your allowed depletion. You don't want to let it you know, drop below here. So that's really the lines we're talking about driving between. And you can see this you know, delay. And, and I asked, you know, this is a field that Corey is very intimate with. And um, you know, I asked him, I said, well, you seem like you, you could have even went further, right? This is a sum uh, between the, the 12 inch, 24 inch, 36 inch and 48 inch um, soil sensors on the probe in the ground, and um, you could have went a little further. You know, Corey's like, yeah, you know, we could have, but you see this at 48 inches, you know, they're really, you know, had plenty of water sitting here at 48 inches, and then all of a sudden that 48 inch level started dropping. 
you can see here at 12 inches, you know, there's kind of a steady drop. This is pretty flat, but, but there's still, you know, a drop, same thing here. But for whatever reason, I don't know if, uh, if the roots were pulling from this area, but, but this sudden drop really helped uh, them make the decision that it's time to go ahead and put some water back into the soil profile. So you can see this first irrigation event and you can see, you know, they brought this up a little bit. Then this next period of time, over a couple of weeks, you know, a little bit of a dry down water consumption, it's getting hotter. Um, we're now in the middle of May in this example. And you can see, you know, the second irrigation here. And then you can see the start of a third irrigation. You're probably just, when I took this data, it was just a couple a day ago. Um, so there's, there's the start of another irrigation here that's uh, roughly you know, a week or so, maybe, maybe almost two weeks um, later. So it's just a really good example um, of delaying. And they saved approximately two inches of water. This is a 540 acre uh, pistachio field, so it's a big field. That's about 90 acre feet of water that they saved. And where they're at, um, they're getting Westland's water, it's about $1,000 an acre foot it's not just 90 acre feet of water and a drought, it's $90,000 that, that they saved. So there's, there's a pretty big, uh, pretty big savings there by, by delaying uh, these spring irrigations. It's one of the, it's one of the best times during the, the crop cycle to, uh, especially on, mostly on permanent crops to save water. And then lastly here, what you're really doing is you're just leveraging that winter water bank we didn't have a big bank this year, but we had something there. So Jeff, you uh, this is amazing, right? You got a lot of people leaning forward when you said $90,000, right? I yep. love yep. putting it into real numbers so people can really uh, experience that. Uh, number one, number two, it's so great to actually know what's happening in your soil instead of guessing based on what your neighbor's doing uh, and having that guide you. So that is great to see now. I noticed this is an example of fourth leaf uh, pistachios. If you're working with younger trees, would you have a different uh, strategy? You know, it's a good question. Fourth leaf on pistachios, those, that's, that's a pretty young tree for pistachios. So, you know, I wish I would have had, you know, some, some prior year um, charts on this. It's a good question, I think in general, but it's a good question, especially for periods of drought. We commonly see um, growers over irrigating young trees. In, in gene logic, or if you're using some ETO uh, KC, you know, times KC. So if you're trying to calculate ETC to figure out how much to um, irrigate young trees, you really need to make sure that you've got an environmental factor in there, which is just a multiplier of say 0.25, you know, if it's say first year, 0.5, maybe if it's second year, 0.75, if it's, you know, third year, fourth year, and you're really not going to get to a factor of one, which would be the full ETC until the trees are considered mature. So I wanted to emphasize to everybody that, you know, if you're using ETC, make sure that you're reducing ETC when you're irrigating or determining how much you want to irrigate for young trees. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good point and a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. That helps clarify that. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So our next example is about driving, you know, between the lines and this, this, this grower did a great job so far this year. And you can see here the root zone uh, soil moisture sum is from eight inches to 24 inches. And in this case, in this case, you can see you know, irrigating up to, you know, your, your field capacity point, you can see the drawdown. So some of this is just the daily, the diurnal, you know, effects starts coasting in to his refill point and irrigates, perfect irrigates back up just to the bottom. It's a great, great example. You can see the same thing, the dry down, gets another irrigation, comes up a little bit and follows that you know, path on down. This is showing the individual, this is the roots on some, these are the individual soil moisture sensors that are in the probe at the various depths. 
And you know what I'm showing here in this case, this grower is wanting to manage the moisture in the eight inch to 24 inch range. And in this particular irrigation event, I'm not sure if this was human error. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, this could have been this could have been human error where the runtime here was significantly more than all of the other irrigations, and I can't see any reason for it. And we see this quite commonly, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll emphasize this more when we talk about automation, but human error in terms of starting and stopping pumps um, during irrigation is, is significant, and I'll give a few more examples on it. Another thing I wanted to call out here is when you're looking at how much a particular level within the soil, how much water it will hold, this is your, your, your field capacity for this, you know, this is a four inch sensor. This is applicable any, on any, at any depth. When you see this line flatten out, this irrigation event, and you can see it here as well, and we would expect the four inch uh, layer to, to saturate. Um, and that's what allows then, you see the soil, I'm uh, sorry, the water moving down in the soil at each one of these levels. And so each one of these are, are getting to feel capacity, getting beyond it, and the water is then percolating downward. So in this irrigation, you can see we get a little bit of movement down here, 24 inches, perfect. It's right where he wants to be, eight to 24. You don't really see anything down below that. On this particular irrigation, I believe mistakenly ran too long. I don't know, I haven't talked to, to the grower, um, but here went down beyond the 24. You can see some movement, not a lot, but you can see some movement at, at 26 uh, inches, sorry, 28 inches. And you can see a little bit of movement down here at 32 inches. And I mean, if you look hard enough, you might even say, you know, he got down to 36 inches. So definitely this irrigation event went outside of, you know, his target roots on, is it bad? Nah, it's not, it's probably not that bad. You can see here he got up to the top, you know, of his, um, you know, the wetting zone that he's looking for at field capacity, and that's probably about as far as you'd uh, you'd like to go. So this is the short duration frequent irrigation example, and this is this is from uh, May, sorry, uh, April fifth to May 31st, so, uh, almost almost two months. And you can see a lot of irrigations, a lot of pulse going on here. This is almonds. These are almond, uh, this is an almond orchard. And this particular grower, this field has, has a reasonable amount of, of sand in it. So the water moves pretty good. You can see um, on these various irrigations. So you see movement, you know, pretty, pretty quick when you go down the line. Um, and, you know, this is just, it's a good example of here during the earlier part of the month, probably got a little too close here, got, got a little high in his field capacity band here in his upper, upper limit and did a great job of, of stretching it, you know, stretching some things out, waiting a little bit longer, gone ahead and consuming, you know, some of that water before the next irrigation. And then, you know, getting back to some of the shorter pulses and then driving between the lines here, you know, all the way, you know, the rest, the rest of the way. Hey, Jeff, we've got a question from one of our viewers and they're sure. asking, uh, is it possible to over irrigate with a shorter frequency or pulse type strategy? Sure. Yeah, you can, um, you know, a good example, you know, here, I think, you know, you got a little, you got a little bit of um, quite a bit of water that got bunched up here. So you had some shorts and you had some, a little bit longer irrigation. So this might be a good example right in this area here where you definitely came high up into the field capacity range up into that upper limit. And you can see water, you know, moving you know, quite a ways down. Soil moisture units, you know, are getting as, as high as you see on any of the other areas. So you can, um, over irrigate when you pulse. I mean, it's all about the spacing and the timing, you know, of those pulses. You want to try to stay true and, and just read these, read your soil moisture 
and, and give a, a, a length enough irrigation. So I would say, I know this grower is the averaging six to six to 10 hours on these pulses. And I think there was a few instances where, you know, that got up and was almost double. You know, this I think was like a, maybe a 13, 14. There's a couple of those out here, but this maybe is a good example of shorter, closer, staying between the lines. This one is spacing it out, but going a little bit longer. These are probably 10, 12 hour irrigation uh, sets and still managing it, you know, between the lines. So it's a really good question. Yeah, I can't imagine trying to manage uh, pulse irrigation without a soil moisture sensor to see what was going on. Right, yeah, I, I totally agree. So here's an example of an over irrigation. So I'll, I'll, I'll just jump right down here and say, you know, the, the normal irrigations, this was coming into, you know, the middle of May, 48 hours, um, this, this particular irrigation, you can see the, the soil, uh, the root zone sum is in 28 inches to 48 inches. And, you know, you can see, you know, that, that irrigation got them up into this upper boundary. It looks nice, you know, letting that dry down. You can see water movement down to 48 inches, which was the target area, 28 to 48. Really nothing happened down at the 56 inch level. That's the bottom of the sensor. This is a five foot, 60 inch um, uh, soil moisture probe. And then I, again, it's so hard to know why you would irrigate 72 or 74 hours other than there could have been human error. The irrigator, um, got called off to do something else. Um, something broke down, couldn't get back, just totally forgot. I, I really, I really don't know. But when you look at this um, 72 hours, it's, it's, you're getting water, you know, all the way down here to the 56 inch level. And um, I, what I did on this one, I wanted to show the infiltration chart on this so this is that same same field looking at the soil uh, infiltration chart, and you can see, you know, with those two irrigation events, you're clearly going down uh, past that 56 inch, you know, level, and that's really it's wasted water. I mean, those trees are not going, you know, down below probably that 48 inch level, and so if you were to look at the difference, just to kind of try to put this into perspective, make it make it relevant. If you were to look at this and say, you know, I, I looked at the application rate, it's 0.02 inches per hour in this particular case. And you take the difference between 48 and 74 hours, it's 26 hours. So that's gonna give you 0.52 extra inches. All right, so say, well, okay, it's not that, not that bad times the 74 acres, it's 38.48 acre inches, which is about, you know, three acre feet um, or at $1,000, you know, a, a uh, an acre foot, it's $3,000. And that's for one irrigation. You know, I hope this doesn't happen a bunch because again, if you, if you keep repeating that, you're pushing water way past the root zone. This is an example of not driving between the lines and an example of what we see where over irrigation um, is, is not good, you know, during a, uh, during a drought period. Yeah, thanks for putting that number to it again, right? If we had like on the gas pump, the, uh, the bell that went off, right? Every right. time you hit a dollar, you, know, you have that awareness to what's going on. We don't typically have that with uh, water. This is great. Right. Yeah, maybe, maybe instead of soil moisture probes, we should change the units. You know, we've got the different units, um, you know, percent volume and a couple of other, you know, different units. Maybe we need to put dollars in there. Yeah. But, you know, this is, this, this graph <laughs> it's, is in dollars instead of uh, depth. Yeah, it certainly would uh, catch a lot more attention. That's for sure. Absolutely. So let's move on and talk a little bit about flow and pressure monitoring. And really when you're looking at this, we're talking about a simple flow meter um, out, out in the field. In this case, it's Symmetrics uh, flow meter. Everybody's probably familiar with that. Um, connected to a C3, you can see the base of the C3 sitting here. 
And with flow meters, you're going to get instantaneous flow, and that'd be your gallons per minute. And uh, you know, that's uh, we'll we'll talk a little bit why that's important in just a minute. You also can get total, you know, measured flow. So how much water is flowing through this this pipe, um, typically coming off your know, your water source, your pump, your filter station, etc. The key here is that this is the total. So if this was feeding one field and one set, you'd have everything you needed, you know, right here. If this was feeding two sets or three sets or four sets or multiple fields, you would only have the total water that was was flowing here and being consumed here, and you would need. Um, a infield pressure switch or pressure transducer out in each one of those fields or those sets if you wanted to be able to calculate the applied water on a per set basis. And the difference is an infield pressure switch, it's just looking at a change in pressure. It doesn't give you an actual pressure value. So it doesn't give you PSI. It gives you a one or a zero with a one being that, you know, the pressure, there is pressure in the line exceeds, let's say you set it to, you know, four or five PSI, which means irrigation is on and running. And then when irrigation is turned off and that pressure goes down below that value again, then you go back to zero and we track that time between, <clears throat> between those two events. And you can take that time times the application rate and you can get your applied water on the field and we can, you know, I'll show you some statistics and some things like that that we can do from that. But it's a very simple device. This is a pressure transducer that's sitting a, at a filter station. So in this case, I don't, I can't tell looking at that small picture if that's a pre or post filter pressure. But again, I'll show an example and, um, you know, the pre and post filter uh, pressure transducers are important for just looking at the pressure differential I can tell you a lot of different, uh, a lot of different things um, and insights into your uh, your field and what's going on. Which again, managing the water using this information really helpful during uh, drought periods of time. So here's some applied water uh, data from those uh, sensors that we just looked at. Here you've got ETC. This this happens to be uh, from AgriLogix. You have applied water. This is calculated applied water from an infield pressure uh, pressure sensor, pressure switch. And you can see this is tracking very well with ETC. It looks like it's short. A lot of people think, oh, I gotta make up this gap. You really don't because this is early in the season. This starts in January. This is early in the season. There's water in the soil. Um, you've had some rain again this year, not a ton of rain, but you've got some rain that, that has occurred and the soil profile is hopefully enough to, uh, to carry you through that. And so, but now when you look at these two and compare, you know, they're tracking pre pretty nicely. So it's a good example of using that applied water. In this, in this case, you're looking at the monthly applied water and each month this updates and it gives you your total uh, applied water including if there was any, you know, measurable, you know, monthly rain. And in this case, you know, looking, you've got 13.7 inches in, in May uh, so far for a total volume of 20, 20 acre feet. So again, it's, it's good to be able to see that. The questions you ask yourself and when water is, is tight, is this where I want to be? Am I expecting 13.7 inches um, for this particular, for this particular crop? I think this one is kind of cool. This is that same graph, but you click on the years. These widgets are, are out of uh, Jane Logic, our software, but today's not the software day, but I, I need to be able to show you how to use the hardware and, and how the data is relevant. So um, these widgets are from the Jane Logic software. And in this case, I clicked years. I went, I found a customer that's had a good history here. It's not the same uh, customer as this, but I found a customer that had plenty of history. So this customer's got data going all the way back to 2016 on this particular field. And you can see it's been pretty consistent. There's a little variation, you know, every year these two are pretty, pretty darn uh, close. And this, these blue bars, they give you year to date where you're at right now. So this was as of yesterday. So May, where are we at? We're May, uh, June 3rd, God, time flies. And you can see, 
you know, at this time of year, 2017, they had put out a lot more water than in some of these other years. Last year, this year, a little bit less than I would say almost every year, except for maybe back in 20, 2016. Maybe that's intentional. Maybe they're really managing their water tight in this case, but it allows you to see both where you, what you did uh, total for the year, as well as where you're at in the year so far compared to the current year. So again, a great way to compare, um, see where you're at and help manage your, uh, your water. So Jeff, I'm sorry on yeah. that last slide. That's okay, yeah. You mentioned um, satellite based uh, and, and I see the agrologics on here. Does mm -hmm. that take special hardware? Or what, what, do, what do you do for that? Yeah, if you want to buy a satellite, we have satellites for sale. Um, <laughs> and Gene, Gene will launch them for you and uh, will fly exclusively over your field. Now, um, yes, this data on the serious side, this data comes from our partner AgriLogics and any grower using Gene Logic um, with uh, monitored fields uh, gets the Gene, uh, sorry, gets the AgriLogics ETC data as well as the NDVI and Vigor data. And, you know, it's not so much this, that's, that's kind of a little bit outside of the scope of the hardware side, but it's, it's really important data that is available. Vigor is critical during these times, especially when you're managing the water very tightly. Um, the ETC value is, is obviously, we've had webinars on that before, as far as really looking at the replenishment method and only irrigating uh, to the level that you're, you know, the field is uh, consuming the water. So that's a good question. And yes, it is, it is available. And we've got somebody making a comment here. What you get for the value, what you pay, it's an incredible value. There's a lot of great information there uh, at, at a very good price. Well, I don't know who that was, but uh, Somebody send them a hat or, you know, something. <laughs> we, we love those, love those folks. So this is kind of interesting. This is, this is looking at flow and pressure. So this is with one of our growers that has a pulse system out. So pulse being looking at pre and post filter pressure at the filter station, as well as a flow meter um, data at the, uh, at the filter station. So it's, it's those images that I just showed um, on the hardware, this is the kind of data that you see. And I've zoomed in pretty pretty tight on this um, to, to part of an irrigation event because it's got some things in here I want to show. So looking at the post pressure, you can see these little dips. And these little dips are flush, you know, when the filter station is back flushing. And you can see it's not quite as prevalent here on the uh, inlet pressure. So this is an area where you can look and see, you know, and is it back flushing? Is it changing? When you, when you look at this and you look at your own data and you get a feel for, it's like driving your truck. And when something starts knocking or vibrating or making noise, when guys walk up to their pumps and they've heard that pump a thousand times, if there's a bearing that's starting to go out or there's something, you know, weird going on, they can hear it. They get, they get a feel for it. If you take that same approach with your data, you'll have that same sense. And so looking at things like this, it looks subtle and it is subtle, but if during an irrigation cycle, you were expecting, you know, um, I don't know, just say, you know, three back flushes and black back flushes are expensive. I think it's about 200, I think 200 gallons a minute, you know, for back flush. And it takes about a minute and a half to back flush each tank. So, you know, you could do the math on that and if you're, if you have excessive back flushing, you, you are, you're wasting water and you need to look into why is that? Why, why am I back flushing so much? Is my, is my PD switch, my pressure differential switch, is it working properly or is it set properly? Um, is there something, you know, in, in my tanks that I need to crack them open and look to see, you know, I have a bunch of organic material that's built up in there and it's not, you know, uh, flushing out. It could be that my, my sand, I need to, you know, replenish my sand or replace my sand. So there's, there's some maintenance things to be done there, but this can kind of give you a clue if this changes and it doesn't look like it normally does in terms of the number of flushes that are happening. It's good to dig into it. 
Another one that I found interesting here, and I, I don't know why this occurred, so I have to kind of guess because um, I can't, I'm not, not in the field, but I saw this little bump in flow, and this is in gallons per minute. So this is like the real time flow that's occurring from that, uh, from that pump during this irrigation cycle from the flow meter. So the flow meter saw a little jump here, and at the same exact time, there was a pressure drop. And I looked at that, it was a 3.2 PSI uh, pressure drop. So it was about 8.6%. Uh, and the flow, I put the numbers here, the flow increased from 177 gallons per minute to 193 gallons per minute. That's about a 9% increase in flow. Hmm. And what do we know about pressure dropping and flow increasing? It usually is an indication of a leak. Um, and it and it continued on for the rest of this irrigation. I I don't know. I didn't go you know further out and look. This was just recently, so this these dates are are this was six one, um, to see if on the next irrigation if that flow is higher, maybe there is a leak out there. Maybe they've had uh, something blew out. Um, it, it could be you know is that a lot. I don't know, it's 9%. If you ran 9% extra water, you know, for a few weeks, it adds up. It adds up pretty darn quick. And in a time of drought, that can become pretty, pretty crucial. So it's, it's easy to look for these kinds of things when you have the right sensors in place and the right software in place, which I, I believe wholeheartedly is gene logic, and uh, to see these subtle changes. And you might see the opposite. So I wanted to, you know, just point out quickly for, for users out there and, and anyone, when you look at it, even if you're looking at the, um, the pressure gauges in your flow meter and you don't have software, if you were to see the flow drop, if this went up opposite, if your flow started going down, and this can happen over time, you normally see it over time, and your pressure went up instead of down, it means you probably have clogging or you may have a, a valve. There could be a butterfly valve that didn't get opened uh, all the way back up. It's, it's, it's a quarter closed and it should be all the way open or it's, it's half closed and it should be three quarters, whatever the settings are that you have in your field. Or it could be that your emitters are slowly starting to clog and you need some treatment or um, you need to do some flushing. And you, and you can see that uh, over time you can find these trends where that flow will just slowly start over time. Cause you can look at this over any period. I'm just looking at, a, I don't know, it's like a couple days here. I could look at this for a year if I wanted to and look at what my flow rate is doing over a year to see if that is, uh, is decreasing. So those are a lot of little tricks, if you will, of subtle things that you can look at that can make a big difference. Well, it sure can, Jeff. And a lot of times we think about, you know, if I make just a little progress every day at the end of the year, you know, I'm going to have a big change. Right. But in a lot of your examples, which I really appreciate is uh, a lot of these are double digit changes you can yeah. make uh, fairly easily. I mean, there's some, uh, there's some uh, uh, good reason to, to get going with this right away. Absolutely. Absolutely. So these all go a little faster on this is these are just some more charts on tracking, you know, different flows, you know, this is the daily flow rate. So you can see again, this is looking at um, irrigations over a period of time. I think this is over, I think this is year to date. So this is from January 1st um, through yesterday. And you can see, you know, when they started irrigation and are these the flow rates that you expect? Now, this is almost 2,400. This is like 2,400 gallons per minute, big, big flow. So if this is off, it could be a big problem, right? So whenever you have bigger pumps, bigger losses. And, um, you know, I looked at these and they're tracking pretty good. You know, these are, these are tracking uh, pretty good for gallons per minute. And you can, you can analyze this uh, all you want in uh, using Jane Logic. This is the daily flow in acre feet. So are these, the, is this the amount of acre feet that you're expecting to put out? Again, what did I order or what did I schedule? What did I tell my irrigator to put out versus what am I seeing here is, uh, can clue you in on whether or not you're wasting water. 
monthly flow total. So you can see here, you know, this, this starts at the beginning of the month. You had some irrigations that occurred. So it starts accumulating that. Irrigation stopped, gets flat, end of the month, goes back to zero. Start irrigating here, comes back up, cruising along, no irrigation. Couple little bumps here. So it comes up again, same thing, end of the month stops. We come out here and we can see, you know, here we're later in the year. This is this is more recent, in the last uh, few weeks. So you can see in this case, the number of acre feet, you know, is climbing up on each one of these irrigations. So it kind of gives you a in good indication of, of what you're doing in time in terms of total number of acre feet. And then the bottom graph is just simply the total year to date flow. So this is just, it's, it's, the, it's adding all of this up. It's the cumulative uh, flow in acre feet. So again, is this where I wanna be um, at this time of year um, with this crop? And it's just a great way to, uh, to look at that. It also is, a, is another thing we've had growers do that's a little tip. This maybe isn't so much for drought time, unless the water district's giving you a hard time is to be able to compare your own data from your flow meter with uh, water district records. And uh, certainly we've had a number of, of growers find mistakes and uh, be very thankful that they had their own technology in the field measuring their water use um, when they got their uh, the district water bill. So that's just a, another way to, to kind of use that data. Home stretch. So benefits of automation, I'm not, we've had the plenty of webinars on automation itself. So I'm not gonna go into, you know, what automation is. I think everybody has a pretty good feel for um, controlling uh, pumps and valves, basically turning pumps on and off with a schedule and then opening and closing the valves on that same schedule so that it's when you have automated you know, irrigation. So, Again, we've talked about you know labor savings and all those things. I'm not really going to go you know into that and the ability to go off peak hours. You can capture all this data um, that, that's important and helps you manage your water. Really, what I want to do is talk about reducing the human error or really eliminating it. And again, I did just some quick numbers just to give everyone a sense. If you had 60 hours of overrun, um, it's 4.4 acre feet at 400 gallons per minute. If you were running 600 gallons a minute, it's 13.3 acre feet. And again, these are these are reasonable numbers. I just showed you, um, I don't know, four or five slides ago where it looked like there was an overrun of 26 hours twice on 74 hour irrigations. So it really does happen. And we've had so many times where when we put some of the technology out and a grower might think, ah, you know, my irrigator is pretty good. If I tell him 10 hours, it's 10 hours. Or if it's, you know, 24 hours, it's 24 hours. And then you put technology out there and you're looking at just a simple pressure switch where it's on and off. And all of a sudden you realize that 10 was really 12 and that 24 was really 20 or it was 26 or 28. And, um, you know, I don't know we call it human error. People get distracted. They they get busy. They have other priorities. They get other you know tasks that they need to take care of, and it's easy just to let the water run. And in times of drought, just letting that water run uh, can cost uh, cost all of us, and and certainly cost a lot of a lot of money in those uh, in those instances. And certainly, Jeff, at your uh, example of a thousand bucks an acre feet, I mean that's, yeah. that's a lot of money. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, weather station. Really, in a, in a time of drought, for me, the biggest benefit of a weather station is if you have sprinklers and you don't want to run your sprinklers when it's windy. Some of the research, some of the things I looked at and really don't recommend over five miles per hour that you know, you get a uh, running sprinklers on a windy day, you could lose up to 50% of the water in terms of the water that's made available to the crop. You know, people say, oh, and there's no way, you know, this water is not, you know, what happens is the water gets blown 
out of the effective area um, for irrigating the, the crop and the evaporation is significantly higher. So, you know, one of the things you can do is use a weather station to, to make sure before you start irrigation. Um, and that will help uh, tremendously uh, in terms of saving water. Same thing when it's windy out, hot and windy out, evap you know, evapotranspiration is higher. So you've got a higher evaporation and transpiration. If you could, um, regardless of what type of irrigation is, you, you, you'd irrigate on calmer days. It's not always possible and certainly, you know, realize the realities of that. But wind um, speed does have a, a, a big effect on that. And then with local weather, you know, in your field, you can look at you know, calculated values. It's not, I don't believe it's as good as the satellite data because it's just a single point and you're calculating ETC based on a KC value that's, that's plugged in, it's a derived value versus uh, something that's measured by the satellite but it's way better than not using anything or guessing. So you know, I really do believe that you know, having localized weather in a, in a drought situation is, uh, is beneficial. And lastly, so to summarize, manage your root zone soil moisture precisely. We talked about driving between the lines, probably the number one, um, and if you do that, you won't over irrigate. If you can push your spring irrigation out as far as possible, it's going to save you water and save you money. Again, monitoring the soil moisture to push that out as far as you can. If you'll analyze your flows and pressures, take a look at that, look at the trends, look for changes. You can identify areas where you have uh, poor performance in your irrigation system, you have excess um, flushing on your filters, identify leaks, potentially clogs, you know, clogging within, say, your drip system. So analyzing the flows and pressures is important. We talked about it at the very beginning, and it's not hardware related. It's, it's check your distribution uniformity. It, it might be the biggest thing on here. Maybe I should have put that at, at the top. And then the last part of that is mitigate. You know, if you check it and it's not where it needs to be, I would say spend your money on mitigating that. Get your distribution uniformity up in that 90 plus percent. And, and by the way, I wanna say this, if you have someone doing a distribution uniformity test and they tell you your system's at 98%, it's not possible. It's just not possible. There's no, there's no system, I think in the world, Corey and I were talking about this and um, I, I know there's some, some companies out there that uh, might make those kind of statements, really be skeptical of that. Your, your irrigation distribu distribution uniformity should be coming back in the point, point 0.8, point 0.91, point 0.92 as a max. We've seen a couple that you know got up to point 0.93 and those were new systems um, operating you know, really well. So be skeptical of that. Automate to eliminate the human error. We just, just talked about that. Avoid running your sprinklers on windy days, and then use localized ETC and um, to determine your crop water needs, and that'll help really um, guide you in terms of the amount of water to to put on. So, Jeff, those are some amazing uh, tips, and uh, man, uh, we are all better water managers uh, today, and uh, 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 well, much better water managers today after seeing this than we were before. Uh, thank you. That was, that was really great. We had uh, um, we had one uh, last question here, and somebody's asking, you know, how long can you push out your first irrigation, and uh, how, how you know what's an easy way to figure out how to do that? I would say by driving between the lines. If I go back to that one, you know, image really quick, and I won't take a lot of time because I know it's Friday. I always hate doing these on Fridays. So it's a good way to for me to end the week and uh, for people to start their weekends. But really, it's about these these boundaries, um, you know, between your upper limit and your lower limit. And you could stretch this out. You know, again, I would use these same principles. And if you're managing and your the soil moisture is where it needs to be, and these boundaries are set correctly, you could go. Um, in this case, you saw four months here. 
I've seen it, you know, three, four, five, five months where first irrigation, you know, doesn't occur till, you know, in this case out sometime, you know, mid, mid May. Yeah. There's no rule of thumb here because of the, you know, weather patterns change every year. A lot of rain, cool springtime. You could go, you might go in late mid, mid June. Um, you know, dry year gets hot quicker. You probably can't go quite as long, but this type of tool will help you know um, when you need to irrigate. That's great, right? It is, there's no tip here. It's just follow the data. Right. <laughs> the exactly. data will tell you when to irrigate. That, that's great. So Jeff, if we have some questions or some thoughts or things we think about uh, later on, is there a way we can contact you? You can. I was there, but then you had to ask me that last question. <laughs> I threw you all off. Okay. Absolutely. So you, there's my contact information. I'm always available. We have a tremendous team, you know, at, at uh, you know, in the gene monitoring control and uh, any, anybody would be more than happy to help you. And I'm, I'm always available. Okay, great, Jeff. Thank you again. Thanks everybody for tuning in today. We really appreciate that. Uh, we hope we're providing you with the uh, uh, tools you need to uh, be more educated and be water, better water managers. As you know, all our trainings are on the jamesusa.com website forward slash trainings. And you can also listen to us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. So we're on Spotify, uh, Apple and Google podcasts, as well as iHeartRadio podcasts. So check us out there. Uh, everybody have a great weekend. Uh, we uh, hope you enjoy it and we'll catch you back here next week. Uh, I believe uh, Wednesday, uh, Andy Bellingary is going to be here talking about ways to save uh, water in your landscapes during the summer. So it'll be very informative. Jeff, thanks again. Really appreciate Thank it. You. And thanks everybody for joining us. Talk to you yeah. soon. Thank you.